Okay, so this week we're talking about file permissions. Um, it is a slightly tricky topic compared to some of the others because this one requires a little bit of understanding and a fair amount of memorization. Whereas the rest of it's pretty much memorized the command that does this and away you go. Uh, this you actually have to understand what some of this stuff actually means when you read them. Um, permissions apply to both files and directories. And it determines what the currently logged in user is able to do. Um, it'll determine whether or not you can access a given file or directory. It'll determine uh, whether or not you can read the file, move the file, delete the file, that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, the root user is the exception to this rule because root can go anywhere, do anything to any file. Thus, that's why it's known as the super user account. Um, so basically any user who is root, Linux ignores permissions, essentially. If you log in as root, you get to see all the things regardless. There's no way to actually take it away from root. Even if you take it away from root, root can give it back to themselves. So, you know, if you're root, congratulations, you win. Now, the permissions, when you do an ls-la, or just ls-l, I should say, it has a bunch of different things that show up. The very first set of characters, that's th these ones, I'm moving my mouse around. That's the permissions. But there's more information that goes with that. So the very first 10 bytes, so when you look at that, those are actually sets of bytes associated with it. The first byte tells you what kind of file it is. The rest of them are the access modes, also known as permissions. Back in the day, they didn't call it a permission. They call it an access mode. Read, write, execute. And depending on what combinations of mask you had, it would determine what you could do. Number of links. So that's the, when you look at this, here are the two next to user one, that's the number of links. That's the number of other file system entries that point to that file or folder. The next one is the file owner. So, the first user one is who owns actually owns the file. So user one created that file, good. The second one is the group. So when you think about permissions in Linux, you've got user group, user permission, group permissions, and then the everybody else permissions. And you can have different rules and different uh, permissions based on whether you want to go after a specific user, go after a specific group, or everybody else. Uh, the next one is the file size. The next one is the last Modified date, then the file name. So these were the rest of the items in that list. What we're going to focus up about today the most, though, is that first set. That stuff that's bolded up on the screen. So the very first uh, byte is identifies what this is. So there's a dash, which indicates a regular ordinary file. B, it's a special block device. A block device is also known as a hard disk, a flash drive, a serial port, for those of you that are old enough to remember serial ports. Anything you can stream data to shows up as a block device. C is a character device special file. These were TTYs, dumb terminals. So if it showed up as a C, that was actually a folder that actually represented a dumb terminal. Uh, D is a directory. Congratulations. That one's easy to remember. L is a symbolic link. Uh, we talk about those a little bit later. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's, a f it's a virtual file that points to a real file and or directory. So you can make a copy of that file somewhere else, but that file doesn't really exist there. It's just a pointer to the other file. It's like a shortcut. It's not, but we'll go with like a shortcut for now. Uh, P means it's either a named pipe or FIFO. Um, basically, a pipe is a permanent redirect into another process. 
Um, a common use for pipes are database servers, actually. MySQL and Postgres are, all, are known for using pipes as methods of accessing the content. You can send a command down the pipe and the pipe will puke something back out. So, since we're focusing mostly on permissions, we're going to talk about the next set of bytes, the next nine bytes. You'll see they're arranged in sets of threes. Um, and they are arranged, the first one is the user owner, the next set is the group, the last set is other. For example, I create a file, I'm the owner. I could give permission to CST8102 section 330 as a group, you guys would have group permissions. Other would be people out in the hall. If you want a visual of how that is. So if the owner creates the file or owns the file, the group is, the other one's allowed to look at it, depending on what the permissions are. And then there is the other, which is everybody else. You could use the same theory with a car. You know, the guy owns the car. Passengers are part of the group. And everybody else he's running over is everybody else. So there are actually 12 bits available, but only the first nine we actually use for 99% of the time. There's more at the end that do special jobs but they're rarely, very rarely used. Half the time they don't work anyways, depending on what you're trying to do. So the first nine are the ones we care about. Um, that first point I already covered, basically put, it's the permissions that allow you to control access to files or directories. Um, the system will verify the rights to a file directory whenever a user's trying to access it. So, if you are moving around, you try to change the contents of a file and they don't have permissions, it checks the second you try to do something to it. So it'll check to see if you're allowed to write the file, if you're allowed to read the file, whether or not you're even allowed to go into the directory. So, when I do an LS and I look at the home directories, here's a good example of a series of um, directory listings. You can see root owns everything about home. A user called A66307 owns the A66307 037 and there used to be a user called Frank3, Frank2 and Frank3 but they've actually been uh, deleted and if you notice so now instead of having a username it's just there's just a number 1001. That was a user that's been removed. People in the Frank 3 group can still get in there, but the user itself is no longer owning that directory structure. So, as I described earlier, that's the file type. The next set is the user owner. The next set is the group. The next set is other number of links, the owner, and the group. All right, so when we look at this slide, you'll notice that it shows RWX, R-X, R-X. And basically, the three sets of permissions you can apply to any given user, group, or other is read, write, or execute. Now, execute's misleading, depending on what you're trying to do. However, Read is fairly straightforward. If it's a file, that means you're allowed to view the contents of the file. You can VI the file, you can cat the file, you can open it up in a notepad editor or whatever. You're allowed to read it. If you're doing read permissions to a directory, that means you can see the contents of the directory. If you don't have read permissions in the directory, believe it or not, you're allowed to go into the directory, then you're blind. The files are there. You might even have permissions to patch the files. But if you're not allowed to view the contents of the directory, congratulations. You're just walking around with your eyes closed, guessing at what's in there. Uh, write. Write's fairly straightforward. You can modify the file contents. That was you're allowed to save, file save. Uh, if it's a directory, you can add or remove files or other directories. So on a directory, if you give write permissions, on a directory, that means you are able to delete files under that directory or, you know, create a new directory, add some files, delete that directory, delete the files under the directory. Then you've got execute. 
Execute means if it's a file, you're allowed to run it. It's a program. Um, now, <laughs> things get a little wonkier. A binary file only requires the execute permission. That means things like ls, vi, those are binaries. They're actual programs. If you want to think about the equivalent in Windows, that would be Word, Chrome, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, a program that runs as a binary that's installed, and it does its stuff. A script file, so this would be a Python script, a bash script, insert script here, has to be both read and execute. Read and execute. Why? One, it has to be allowed to be run. That's why it needs to execute. But the read means that the interpreter needs to be able to read the contents of the file. So if it's a script file, so it's a Python script, you go to run the Python script, it'll actually ask Python, run me. If Python's not allowed to, if you're not allowed to read it using Python, it's not going to run. So that's the weird, the slightly strange thing about execute. And execute on a directory means you're actually allowed to go into the directory. So for example, I could give you permissions to read the, direct, the contents of the directory, to modify the contents of the directory, and say, nah, you're not allowed to come in here. So what's the point of being able to modify the contents if you can't actually go inside of it? So the execute bit on the directory affects, well, the directory. Now, each three sets can be applied to both the user, the group, and others, as I've already discussed. Okay. There once was a time, and I remember this, before Linux, you used to have to know the octal values to set permissions on files. So nowadays we can say RW, R, you, know, you go chmod, U plus RW means user allowed to read write. Back then we actually had to feed it the full set of octal values for each series. So if we gave a file 655, that would mean that I could read write permit for the user, read and execute permissions for others, and for the group. We actually have to know what the octal values were. And yes, you will be tested on what the octal values are. So this is a really handy little chart to memorize. If you suck at memorization, I'm sorry. That's too bad. Because that's all an octal is. And it's always set in three sets of octals, right? User, group, other. So they, whether it's 0 to 7, it makes no difference if 0 to 7 for the user or if it's a group because they have a separate value for each of them. So you just need to memorize 0 to 7. Yeah, pretty much. So 0 means you're not allowed to do anything. 7 means you're allowed to do all the things. And then there's a varying series of values in between. And you know, as you can see, it's pretty much arranged on left like binary. So read, write, execute, it's a mask. It's not binary values per se, it's a mask. But it reads out like a binary value because 111 in binary is 7 in octal. So somebody, when they were setting all this up, decided to follow the com common computing concepts of the time because octal was a very popular way of doing things. The good news is now is that we now have symbolic mode. R for read, W for write, X for execute. That means you don't need to remember the mask, the octal value for it, except for when you get tested. Um, so there's you can do absolute or octal mode versus symbolic. Symbolic means that it'll apply the appropriate mask. Octal, also known as absolute, will set that no matter what. It doesn't play around with whatever the values are. So old time network admins still prefer to use octal over symbolic. In the end, the effect is exactly the same. Um,
So read permission means that there is a one in the first column. Write means there's a one in the second column. Exit means there's a one in the last column. And if you put them all together, you end up with one, 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 or seven. Okay. So when we look at some of these examples, this symbolic mode is equivalent to what octal mode? The very first one. Anybody want to take a guess? 777, seven, seven, because it's all permissions. And that means that the user has the following permission, would be all of them, which is read, write, execute, or seven, whichever way you want to mark it. The second set is equivalent to what octal mode? Yep. And the group has what permissions? The group. Yeah, read and execute. And the last one is? Yes. I had to re I, I couldn't remember off the top of my head. And therefore, if it's 765, everybody else has what permissions? Read, execute, which means they could run a script file. They could view the contents, con contents, <sighs> contents of a file. They could run it as a script using a script, a script interpreter. So file permissions can be modified with a command called chmod. Stands for change mode. If you never knew what chmod stood for, change mode. Mind blown. Because permissions and Linux are actually modes of a file, not permissions. And the command can be used two different ways. You can use the symbolic method, which is chmode or chmod, depending on how you want to word it. And then you can give it who, is, who it applies to. U-G-O-A, user, group, other, or all. This is where you don't need to remember the whole 755 bit. Because you can see you, so you don't have to worry about whether you're playing with just the first value. Because when you use the absolute mode, that means you always have to remember the permissions for every, all three sets when you set them, right? So it's always 755, you've got to give it all the values when you do the octal way. With this, you can say user only. The next one is plus, minus, or equal. Plus means you're given the permission. Minus means you are taking the permission away. Equal means you're setting it explicitly. And then the next set is the other values, RWX. So you tell which ones you want to give it. And then you tell it what object or object mask you're going to apply. Now, when using the abs absolute method, which is you know, the numbers, uh, chmod uses numbers to specify the permissions for the user, the group, and the others. And you have to give all three every single time. So it's chmod xyz, whatever it is. So chmod 644 my file. And if you omit the digits, it gets padded with zeros. So if you go chmod 7 my file, it assumes a 007. It strips the permissions off of the user, the group. Yes, it goes the wrong way. It adds the zeros to the left, not to the right. So it actually moves the digit down the mask. So for example, in XYZ, if I did 644, but I just went chmod 4, it would go chmod 004 and taking away the permissions for the user, the group, and only the others get to keep their permissions. It's a special thing. By special, I don't mean special. I am going to do a few quick demos at the end. Uh, there is a very important 
um, argument, you can feed chmod dash capital R, not to be mistaken with minus lowercase r, because that removes the right permission, dash capital R sets recursive. In other words, it crawls through the current tree down. So everything else that is a child will get its permissions modified. And that's what it does. So there's five examples up on the screen in red. All of them do the exact same thing. Just to show you that there's more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to setting permissions. Um, 777 is the same as all read, write, execute. UGO is the same thing as read, write, execute. A equals RWX. Again, we'll set it to read, write, and execute. And, you know, user, group, and other will also set it. Those five commands do the exact same thing. Yes? Try that again. Yeah, there's a, yeah, when you do the digits, only octal numbers. So you feed it anything past seven and it just, no. It won't let you. All right, here comes the worst part. Up till now, it's just memorization. This is where the site understanding needs to come in. When you log into a Linux machine, you have a default set of permissions applied to you. And there's two steps. There's the initial permission, the initial mode, and then there's the max value. So when you first log in, everybody has 666 for files and 777 for directories. Everybody has full read-write access to everything, by theory. And then what happens is it takes the U, something called the U mask and applies it. And as you'll see down here, U mask is not subtracted, it is a mask. Honestly, it's subtracted. Just saying, it is subtracted, but not the way you think it is. Yeah, whoever made these slides really wanted to make the point that it's not, subtra it's not subtracted, it's a mask. So if a directory has full permissions, 777, and there's a umask of 000, guess what? The permission stays, 777. Now. If the directory's permission start with 777 and it has a umask of 022, then now the default permissions are 755. Now people are like, well, that is subtraction, isn't it? Um, you know, take 777 and take out 22, you end up with 755. But here's why it's not a subtraction. If you go It's not a fact that it's a pure subtraction. It, the subtraction only happens per column. So this will stay seven, this becomes five, and this becomes five. If the permissions were seven, two, two, and the mask was set to zero, five, five, it's not gonna take it off like you normally, you know how you normally do a subtraction where you'd suddenly you'd go, you know, one, oh, this is 12. Oh, now this is 11, this is 6. No, nah, this is 700. Zero, zero. Because you're taking away the full set of permissions off that. Assuming that's the default permissions that the file was created with. It doesn't mean that's normally how it works, but, you know, just saying that's how the math works. It works per column, not like a normal subtraction, which is why we make the point of saying it's not subtracted, it's a mask because the mask applies to each of the columns individually. So if full permissions for files is 666, and you use a umask of 022, you end up with for basic perm starting permissions of 644. 
That means that when you create a file, it's read-write by you, readable by your group, readable by others. That's all there is to it. And we could go the other way with the extreme. We go if full permissions on the directories is 777, you do a umask of 777, guess what happens? You'll create a file that you can't even edit, delete, rename, even change permissions on. Because you basically nuked, you nuked yourself. And the only one that can come and fix it is root at that point. Because root ignores the permission masks. <coughs> All right, so when we want to look at default permissions for a user, the command is just straight up umask. And actually, It happens to be that my umask is set to 002 on Ubuntu 16. Apparently in Ubuntu 18, the umask is different, which is why Lab 4 is a little wonky depending on what version of Ubuntu you have installed. The last three digits, the fourth digit at the beginning, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. Drawing a blank, I think it's in the slides, I'll get to it. But the umask usually is the last three digits. So you can change your umask yourself. You can set umask 044. So if I were to change my umask when I create a directory, things are going to look a little different. So I'm going to go home. All right, so you can see a file called perms. Currently, my umask is 002. So that means that everybody can read write. I can read write. Everybody else can read. If I were to change my umask 044, and I go, I've now changed the rules of engagement where suddenly I can read write, everybody else can write, including my group. And I could actually go with like that also. So easier to, to remember than the octal way of doing the U mask, because then you're saying, when I create files, anybody in my group can read write these files. And now you can see on the last row, after I've changed the permissions using the symbolic notation, which personally I find a heck of a lot easier to work with than the mask. I can set the permissions that way, so my default permissions. So every time you create a directory, it sets the default permissions. Now, some people wonder, well, what's the use of this? Because odds are most people don't log into a Linux server. When you end up using Linux to do as a file share server, so you're sitting on a network, and even though it's a Windows network, it's very common to actually be running the file share servers using a Linux or Unix machine. And it uses something called Samba to expose it to Windows machines. So it's the network can be Samba. And when you connect, it extracts your domain user, your Windows user, and it looks at the username, which should map to a Linux user. And then it looks at your default umask of your Linux user to determine what permissions your files are going to have when you write them into that server. So these are the default permissions as it is. So if you were to log into the command prompt, you'd have the same permissions as if you used Samba, unless, of course, the Samba server was changing your umask for you, which is actually pretty common. Um, another spot where you might notice the umask being used. How many of you remember using FTP? OK, a few. Yay. Welcome to the few. FTP was how you used to get files off the internet. 
You still can, but FTP is proven to be very insecure. And if your servers are hosted in the states, I can guarantee they're pa they're logging every packet you transmit. Um, we've actually experienced it at work, so we know. The when you use FTP, it uses permissions and a UMass to determine whether or not you're allowed to see the files in your directory structure, whether or not you're allowed to upload, download files, that kind of stuff. It uses the same sets of permissions. Okay, so to create a default file mode of read, write, 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 what would be the UMask? You sure? Zero two two. Yes. It's better off if I actually type it and do it in front so that we can all confirm together. So it's your choice. You can memorize one or the other. Or memorize them both. Because you know. After a while, you can just memorize and do it on your fingers, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. And that executes the last one, yep. Yeah. So 110 is 6. 111 is 7. Yeah, some people memorize it better that way by remembering the different spots and then converting the binary to octal. Each their own. Uh, to create a default file mode for read-write across the board, what would be the UMask? <laughs> yeah, that's for files, yes. Not for directories. Because that would be, in the end, the permission would be 666 because it's a file. 555, five, five, sorry. And then to create a default file mode of no permissions, the UMask would be? 666. And if I was doing it with a directory, it would be 777. So a new file with the UMask of, with the starting permissions, 666, with a UMask of 022, what would be the permissions in the end if we go the other way around? Yep. And again, 666 with 011 would be 655. And the directory with UMask of 011. Yep. Um, more examples on how you change permissions. UMask, touch. This is actually a complete set of ex exercises where you can just type them in. So if I set my UMask to 022, And I go touch file two. You can see there's read, write, read, read. And if I go 652 file two, now you can see that the file has read, write, read, execute, and write, which is a very strange set of permissions. Or I could go user execute, group remove execute, others are allowed to read. And now we end up with read, write, execute, read, read, write. Again, a strange set of permissions. The only one that's actually really useful is the user's permission because that's usually who you care about the most, but you know. So this one here is changing permissions to the user in the group is only allowed to read the file. Others are, allow are not allowed to write it. And that is where that ends because essentially at that point everybody can only read the file. It's a great way to make sure you don't nuke the contents of your file. All right, so 
So far, we set permissions. In other words, who's allowed to touch it, what they're allowed to do with it, whether they're not even allowed to look at it. <coughs> but let's just say you want to change the ownership. The command is chown. So before we had chmod, also known as change mode. Now we have chown, which is change owner. And the way it works is chown, the new owner, whatever the file is called. You can include dash capital R, which makes it recursive. And once you change the owner of the directory and all its subdirectories, you know, depending what you do, you may lock yourself out of your own files because, you know, that's lots of fun. Um, you can also use it to change just the group. The prefix the group with a period. So in other words, chone.new group, whatever the file is called, will change just the group and not you know, the owner. So for example, if I went, so file two is owned by A66307, belongs to group A66307. If I were to go, ah, not allowed to do that. Because I'm not root, I can't make it be owned by root. And I can't, let me try one more thing first. I'm not allowed to make it owned by root because I'm not root. If I was root, I could make it owned by root. So let's go. Actually, let me clear that. Now you can see that I just changed the group, so it's still owned by A66037, so that's still the effective permissions for that user, but now it belongs to the group of roots. So that means anybody who's in the group root group would be allowed to go play with the file, depending on the permissions also. If I were to go, if I do user.group, means you're changing both of them. Now you can see that that file is now owned by root and belongs to the group root. I guarantee that the user A66037 cannot do anything with this anymore. He's got an immovable block in the middle of his home directory. And again, I can actually change it back to be I gave it back to A66037, just like that, by doing the chone. Uh, you can choose to either use a period or a colon to separate the user and the group. It doesn't care as long as you've divided it. Um, if you want to just change the group ownership, you can actually use ch group, change group. So we had change owner, change group, and it allows you to change the group of a file without actually changing the owner of the file. So if you're a regular user, you can actually change the ownership of a file or directory, but you have to be a member of that group to be able to do it. So earlier I was trying to change the group of the file to root User A66037 is not part of root, so they did not have permissions to make it part of group of root. So you can't change. Let me, let me word it like this. You can't sell a car that doesn't belong to you. Does that make sense? People do it, but you know. You're not supposed to be able to sell a car that doesn't belong to you. You don't have the ownership or the ownership mem like the membership to be able to change to sell that car. So if you go to a car dealership, the sales reps are all members of the sales group. They're allowed to sell you a car. But you're not allowed to walk onto a dealership and sell a car to someone else because you don't work there. You're not part of that group. So that's what this is saying, is if you want to change the, or the group on a file, you have to be at least a member of that group to, to allow it to happen. 
All right. There's minimum permissions. When you're trying to achieve this, and believe it or not, we're almost through the slides. They're not long lectures. They really aren't. It's just a lot of information, you know, condensed. There's some minimum permissions you need to perform certain operations. And the typical operations are copying, copying and creating, moving and deleting. Okay? So to delete a file, For the directory, you must have write and execute permissions on that directory. It means that you have to be able to write contents of that directory, and you have to be able to go into that directory. It'd be like I'd, I'd, I'm out in the hallway, and I want to remove a student from the classroom. But I don't have permission to come into the classroom to remove you. Let's say I got a bad student, I got to call security. But security is not allowed to walk into the room without me giving them permissions to walk into the room. So that's why the directory have execute permissions to allow you to delete a file. They have to be you have to be allowed to go into that directory to delete it. And the write permission for the directory means you're allowed to modify the contents of the directory. The file, on the other hand, you don't need any permissions. You could have a zero 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 set of permissions on it. You could still delete it as long as you got the appropriate permissions on the directory. So you can get rid of pesky permission problem files by just having the permissions on the directory. To copy a file, a user must have execute on the directory. In other words, I want to take a student, take him out and copy them from this room, from T119, put them in T117. Okay, I have to be able to come into this room to grab the student, right? So that's why I need to execute permissions to come in. If I'm going to go into T117 to put them in there, I need to have write and execute. That means I'm allowed, I have to be allowed to change what's happening in 117, and I have to be allowed to go in there. Because what's the point of, you know, copying something if you can't go where it's supposed to go? And for the file itself, I have to be able to read you. In other words, I have to be able to see you. So I want to copy you to put you in another room. I have to be able to come into the room, I can see you, go to the other room, and I can regurgitate you. I don't need permissions on the file, I just need permissions on the room itself, the directory. To move a file, on the other hand, I want to physically move you from one room to the other. For the source directory, I need to be able to write and execute. So I have to be able to walk into the room, physically grab you and take you out of the room. Now you're out of the room, you're gone. Why? Because I deleted you from this room. To be able to delete, you have to be able to exit to write to that directory. That's how you delete something. And to be able to put them in the other room, you have to be able to write and execute. In other words, I have to be able to go into the other room and then put you down. So when I'm actually putting in a file, it's writing. Do you notice I don't need any permissions on the file itself? So I don't even need to be able to see you. I can move you without even seeing you. I can do it blind. It's a weird thing where, you know, you think that the permissions of the file would protect you from this. No. The directory controls this. So, that is that. Now, I actually will go back a few slides just to make a few points of things that, you, that really need to be remembered. And PowerPoint is not going back anymore. All right, let me pull up the slideshow again. This, this slide. Okay, this slide, like I said uh, when I was going through it, very important one. You really want to memorize this because, you know, you really want to memorize it. What else, what else I can say to that? Um, you want to remember what all these bits and pieces are for the sets of permissions. So that's another important slide to remember. And this slide, she shows up just as I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> 
this slide is probably the on this set of slideshow is probably one of the other ones that are important to understand and to memorize. The other ones are just memorizing the commands, and I've already warned you guys, you have to memorize the commands and what the switches are for these commands or the format, the syntax of these commands. It's not like Java or database, where not only do you need to understand, you have to memorize some cryptic syntax that makes absolutely no sense. Or some cryptic naming convention that somebody insists on inflicting on, on their students, depending on what the course is. So memorize the commands. This set of slides, there was chmod, chown, chgroup. Three commands out of 30 slides. That's like, you know, a 10% content level here of slides. And each of those really only have ch, chmod is the one that's got the most arguments because it's got the permission mask and what you're applying to. And the change owner, again, has the owner and the group. And they all have the recursive argument. So those are the important ones to remember for this. Um, <coughs> this should give you everything you need to get through lab three, if I remember right. And uh, yeah, that wraps up today. The Linux lectures are really short. We actually got to work to stretch them. The recursive, the recursive argument is dash capital R. So you go chmod dash capital R, the rest of the arguments. Then it just crawls through the tree downwards. <laughs>